if you want Allah to persist in doing the things, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah says, if you want Allah to persist in doing the things that you ask him to do, then persist in doing the things that he commands you to do. And I hope inshallah ta'ala you'll, you'll consider giving to Yaqeen uh, as well as some of the other wonderful efforts that are out there. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So this is a subject typically when we talk about du'as and the acceptance of du'as, we talk about the deeds that cause du'as to not be answered, right? The deeds that cause our du'as to not be answered and the deeds that cause trials, bala, to descend upon us. And there are numerous ahadith in that regard and sayings and traditions uh, that we can find from the Prophet ﷺ and from the Salaf and from the pious predecessors. Of course, the most famous one where the Prophet ﷺ mentions to us a person who goes out and calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in des- desperation, says, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, O oh my Lord, O oh my Lord. But his food is prohibited, his food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothes are haram, he's sustained in haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, On what basis? Is this person to be responded to? So that is a hadith that is frequently quoted for good reason. Uh, because we have to make sure that as we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ That we also answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want Allah to persist in doing the things, Imam Ahmad rahimahullah says, if you want Allah to persist in doing the things that you ask Him to do, then persist in doing the things that He commands you to do. So this is... A very important concept and uh, we cannot emphasize this enough. I was thinking about the other side of this and this is what I want to talk about inshallah ta'ala uh, tonight which is what causes our dua to be answered. What are the deeds that cause our dua to be answered? Of course there are certain things that we say in our duas uh, that cause them to be answered. There is sincerity which is the essential ingredient to everything that we do not just dua that would cause it to be accepted inshallah ta'ala. But what is it that we can do in terms of deeds that cause our du'as to be answered just like we avoid deeds that cause our du'as to be rejected? And there is a famous hadith that meant a lot to me after, particularly after I heard uh, a way that uh, a great scholar had interacted with this hadith. And it's the hadith about three men that go to a cave and then a, uh, a huge boulder uh, covers the entrance to that cave and they're stuck in that cave. So the Prophet wasallam says, all three of them came together and they said, call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a deed that you did only for his sake so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant us relief. So all three of them come together and they offer a deed that they did only for Allah's sake as a means of having their dua answered. And so the first person calls out and he mentions how he used to take milk to his parents every single night. He would uh, go out, he would work, he would milk what he had, and then he would take that milk to his parents before he would even go to his own family, to his own children. He would always go to his parents first. And this is, of course, a crucial lesson in the honor of the parents, something that you know we've been trying to stress over the last few weeks in particular. So he would go to his parents every single night and he would serve the milk. And they'd be waiting for him to arrive so that he could serve them that milk. But this time in particular, when he got to the house, they were sleeping. So what did he do? He didn't want to disturb them. He stood with the bowl of milk next to their bedside while they slept. He let them sleep in peace. His children wanted that milk. Others wanted that milk. He waited for his parents as he always did to serve them first. And once they woke up, he gave them that milk. And he said, Oh Allah, if you know that I did this only for your sake. And this is the common thing that all three of them are going to say in some version. In kunta ta'lamu anni fa'altuhu ibtigha'a wajhik. If you know that I did this seeking your pleasure, then uh, re- relieve us of this hardship. Okay, give us uh, relief from this hardship. And so he calls out to Allah with that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the boulder to move. Another man, the second man, calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he gives this instance where he says that I had a cousin who I desired greatly and she was obviously someone that would protect herself from zina, from fornication. And there was a year of famine where she became very vulnerable and she needed money. So he kept on approaching her and she got so desperate that she said if he gives her a hundred dinars, 
then she will give him what he wants. So he gave her the money. And just as he gave her the money in her vulnerability and he was about to take advantage of the situation, he was right about to commit that act of fornication. She reminds him, she says, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not break the seal unlawfully. So he said, at that moment, I got up and I left her. And oh Allah, if you know that I did that only seeking your pleasure, then relieve us of this hardship. So the boulder moved again and there was just a little bit more left so that they could uh, escape from the cave. So the third man calls out and he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I was a, a person that hired uh, laborers to uh, to go out and to uh, to work on my farm, to work in my field. And he said that there was one man that I did not get to pay. He disappeared and I didn't get to pay him his wages. So he said, I took that money and I invested that money because I couldn't find the man to pay him what I owed him. And as I invested that money, and there was so much blessing in that money that it grew my farm tremendously. I was able to purchase all sorts of cow and, and cattle and, and herds, herds of sheep uh, with that money. And the man shows up a time later, long after, and he asks me to repay him. Now, obviously, he could have just sent him off, but he doesn't do that. He says, take all of the all of what your money earned. He didn't just pay him what he owed him back then, but he offered to give him everything that that money ended up being invested to and producing. SubhanAllah. So take it all, everything. And the man says to him, you know, are, are you making fun of me? Don't mock me. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't mock me. And he says, La I'm not making fun of you. I'm not mocking you. I mean it. Take everything that that money earned, not just the money that you were owed then, but what that money was invested into and what it ended up producing. And he said, oh Allah, if you know that I did this only seeking your pleasure, then relieve us of this anxiety, of this trial. And when he said that, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the boulder was completely moved and that those three men were saved. Now, this hadith is a beautiful, rich hadith. And honestly speaking, a proper sharh of this hadith, a proper explanation of this hadith could go on for over an hour. So I'm just going to say that there are many beautiful explanations of this hadith in detail that look at the various layers of this hadith, the way that each man not only you know encountered a situation that was similar to the other, but also encountered a situation that was very unique in that it involved you know parents on, on one hand, it involves the topic of zina and adultery uh, on, on the other hand, and, and one of them involves um, you know principled business. So all of their situations in and of themselves require a shot, require a proper explanation. But what I want to talk about it from the perspective of is what causes du'a to be answered? What are the consistent threads between the three of them as far as deeds that cause du'a to be answered? And is there something that relates particularly to du'a, to supplication in the situations that they were in? So the first one is what? The first one is obviously sincerity. Deeds that were done only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Deeds that were done for Allah. You're making du'a to Allah, so make sure that you're making du'a to Allah with the deed that you did for Allah. And you know that you purely did it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. No one else. It was done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sincerity, the ultimate ingredient of an accepted du'a. And here, sincerity in a deed being translated into a sincere du'a. Right? They are communicating, articulating, and they know that Allah knows what's in the heart. That, Ya Allah, when I did that deed, you know that there was no one in my heart but you. That it was for you alone. So, Ya Allah, as I'm calling upon you alone, again, with a heart in which there is no one but you, Ya Allah, grant me the answer to this dua. So, sincerity in the deed is an ingredient for success and communicated sincerely in dua as well. So, that's the first thing. I did these deeds only seeking your pleasure, O Allah. So any deed that is done only seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the means of an accepted dua, is a, is a means by which your supplications are going to be accepted as well. But there are two other things to derive from these three situations that particularly relate to dua. And that is that all three of these men were in a position of power meaning they, they could have taken advantage of the situation. They did not have to 
show the generosity or the mercy that they showed in those situations. They could have found a way out of those situations. The man could have easily taken the milk to his children and his parents wake up the next day and they say, where is the milk? He says, too bad, I came home, you were sleeping. What are they going to do? What are his parents capable of doing to him? The, the second man could have taken advantage of the girl and, you know, again, there was a deal. They had a deal. He had the strength to overpower her. He had the leverage to overpower her because he paid her the money and she was vulnerable. He could have done that. Who was going to hold him accountable? The third man could have, you know, said to the man, you know, look, time is up. You can't come years later and ask for your money. Uh, there was no way for me to know that you were going to come back later. I assumed you were gone and I had to move on with my life. You should move on with yours as well. What was going to happen in that situation? So all three of them had the power to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they chose not to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of them were in a position of strength in those moments and they chose not to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that strength, okay? And the last, the, the second thing, so the first one is that they were in a position of ability. They were in a position of power. The second thing is that they had people that were completely in need of their mercy and generosity in those moments or in need of their generosity and, and mercy in those moments. Those people's vulnerability depended on, in those moments, the, uh, the the person that was in a position to take advantage of them, not taking advantage of them. The person that was in a position to harm them, not harming them. The person that was in a position to give them, giving them. Okay, so all three of those people on the other side of the equation needed that mercy, needed that generosity, that generosity, needed that compassion from those three men. And they all showed that mercy, that generosity, that compassion. SubhanAllah, there's something very powerful here. That when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has full power and capability over us at all times. And we are always completely in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dependent upon Him and vulnerable, right? And that is the spirit of which the deeds were committed that is also the spirit of which the dua is made and supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's sincerity and it's also that I do deeds even when I don't quote unquote have to, when I'm in a position of power, in a position of strength. And at the same time, I don't take advantage of people that are vulnerable, that depend upon me just because I, you know, I can, just because they... Uh, they can't hold me accountable. They can't do anything about it. That they're basically at the mercy of my orientation in those moments. You're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well to do for you. And you always need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always has power over you. And you are always dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when it comes to deeds of good, good deeds that you do towards others. You know, there are numerous ahadith that speak to the blessing of the deed that is done in a position where most people would be heedless. Most people would be heedless or deluded when they're in a position of power and access and privilege and desire. But this is a person that fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that knows, just like the man who gave water to the dog or uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, Zania, the adulterous woman, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, who gave water to that dog, that I was thirsty and Allah provided for me, and that dog is thirsty, and so I should also provide for that dog, okay? That's the mindset of a deed that causes a dua to be accepted, of a good deed being accepted that causes a dua to be accepted. Now, I mentioned to you all that there was a very particular um, way that I really came to appreciate this hadith uh, from, from a scholar who encountered this hadith in a very unique way. There was a scholar who was um, passing away, or he was, he was about to pass away. He had a, uh, a harsh um, disease. And as he was fighting this disease, he saw this dream while he was unconscious. And he, um, you know, in this dream, sees these three men. And these three men, he, he is the fourth of them, basically. And some of you might know Sheikh Ibrahim Durmali, Hafidahullah Ta'ala. So he was struggling with, um, you know, uh, a very 
uh, severe liver issue, needed a liver transplant, went through all sorts of hardships. So he's calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the dream, or he's with these three men in the dream, and the hadith is playing out in front of him, where these three men are in the cave with him. They're all stuck as four, and they're all you know saying to one another, make a dua with a deed that you only did for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. So each one of each one of them starts to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the deed that they only did for his sake. And, you know, he memorizes uh, the hadith. He, he, he knows Sahih al-Bukhari. And uh, he's watching it play out. And then the difference in the dream is that he's the fourth person and that he is now told by the other three men, now you make a dua with a deed that you only did for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. And the, the boulder is dependent upon him. So he, as the fourth person in the dream, is basically like the third person in the hadith, the last person who needs to think of a deed that he only did for Allah to cause the boulder to move, to have that dua accepted and to cause the boulder to move. So he, I remember him sharing with me, subhanAllah, that he actually had to sit there and think like, okay, what deed in the dream, right? What deed do I know that I only did for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? seeking his pleasure in the spirit of that which we know from the other three men communicated to us by the Prophet Sallallahu What deed did I do, ibtigha awajhihi subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking his pleasure alone? And he thought about it and he made that dua and the boulder moved and that's when he woke up and subhanAllah he uh, recovered from um, that, that horrific uh, illness that he was suffering from. And that, that, experience if you think about it like what if you were in that position what if you were the third person or the fourth person in that cave and you have to make a dua with a deed that you only did for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what would that deed be and if you can't think of deeds in the past think of deeds that you will do between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if you can think of deeds in the past you never know if your intention was taken or part of it was taken by the shaitan what will i do only for allah only for his sake to cause him to be pleased with me to to seek his pleasure subhanahu wa ta'ala and to cause my duas to be accepted may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our deeds and our duas keep us sincere in our deeds and our duas allahumma ameen jazakumullahu khairan